I've had to install some acoustic damping on the walls in my studio because bare walls reflect a lot of sound. When that sound bounces around in a room, you end up with some unpleasant reverb. But you'll know if you've got noisy neighbors that walls don't reflect sound completely. Some sound is transmitted. In other words, you can hear a little bit what the neighbors are up to. And how much sound is transmitted and how much sound is reflected is governed by how different those two mediums are. So you've got the medium of air and the medium of, say, brick in the case of a wall. And the more different they are, the more sound is reflected. The more similar they are, the more sound is transmitted. And when talking about these two mediums being similar or different, I'm talking about a specific property, which is acoustic impedance. Acoustic impedance is sort of like how much does the substance resist acoustic energy? And brick has a really high acoustic impedance compared to air. So almost all sound is reflected at a brick wall. In other words, you can only really hear what your neighbors are saying when they're properly screaming. That all makes sense, but if you know anything about the anatomy of an ear, you might now be wondering, how is it that humans can hear anything at all above just muffles? Because the cochlea, the little organ that has those tiny hairs inside that vibrate backwards and forwards with acoustic waves that pass over them, those little hairs are in liquid, essentially water from an acoustic point of view. So you've got this sound that reaches us through the air, but it ends up in liquid, it ends up in water. And water has an acoustic impedance which is about 3,000 times that of air. If you plug that into the right equations, you find that only about 0.1% of acoustic energy will get across that interface between air and water to reach those little hairs in your cochlea. It's a bit like trying to hear what's happening outside the pool when you dunk your head in the pool. So how is it possible that our sense of hearing is so good? How can we hear all the things that we're able to hear? Your ears are able to transfer most of the acoustic energy from air to the water inside your cochlea through a process called impedance matching. If you've studied circuits at all, you may have come across impedance matching, but it applies to acoustic energy as well. Your ear achieves this in two really clever ways, and they both involve mechanical advantage. The first I'll talk about is the lever inside your ear. So there are these three bones in your middle ear that you might be familiar with, and amazingly, they act as a lever. To illustrate how a lever can overcome the difference in impedance between two mediums, I've res resurrected my wave machine. I made a video a while back about ultrasound gel, which is also used to mitigate reflections that you get when there's a mismatch in impedance between two mediums. In that video, I demonstrate how a wave is partially reflected and partially transmitted at a boundary between two mediums of different impedance. See, the impedance on the left is higher because I've added weights to those rods in the form of nuts. Perhaps you can see intuitively why this happens. At the boundary between the two, the light rod is trying to pull up the heavier rod, but because the heavier rod has more inertia, it can't pull it up as far and the rest of the energy is reflected. If it doesn't make intuitive sense, or if you want a full explanation, I recommend you watch the original ultrasound gel video, but for our purposes here, it's enough to know that the light rod can't move the heavy rod as much because of the extra inertia, so only some of the energy is transmitted and the rest is reflected. How can that be fixed with a lever? Well, let's split the wave machine in two and put a lever in the middle there. At the moment, there's no difference in impedance on either side. It's the same weights all the way along and the lever is pivoted in the middle. So we should expect all the wave energy to be transmitted through the lever. We don't quite see that. Some of the energy is reflected, and that's because the lever isn't perfect. It has some mass of its own, and there's friction there. But in an ideal world, all the energy would be transmitted, and all that would happen is that the, the wave would be flipped upside down by the lever. Let's add some weights to the left-hand side of the wave machine. Now the lever is like an intermediary between two mediums of different impedance, and with the lever pivoted in the center still, we should expect roughly the same amount of transmission and reflection as if the lever wasn't there. And that's roughly what we see. 
So how can we make an adjustment to the lever to alleviate the problem? Well, remember the issue is that you've got a light rod trying to move a heavy rod. And this is the kind of scenario that levers were designed to deal with. Like, Look, you've got a heavy object and a light object on either side of this lever, and the heavy object is winning. But if you want to balance things out, then you just move the pivot point or fulcrum of the lever, as it's properly called. In this way, you're giving the lighter object mechanical advantage. You're now able to move that heavier object with the lighter object, or in other words, with a smaller force than you would have needed otherwise. By the way, you're not gaining any energy magically in this scenario. Although you're able to move a heavy object with a smaller force, that smaller force has to travel over a greater distance so that the work done is the same as it was before. So let's try that out now with our wave machine. By moving the fulcrum of the lever towards the medium of higher impedance, we're giving the medium of lower impedance a mechanical advantage. And look, more of the energy is transmitted. Remember, it's not just about the amplitude. That side is heavier, so even a small amplitude carries a lot of energy. The point is, there isn't as much reflection. We're still going to get a little bit because, as always, the lever isn't perfect. But we've done a good job here of transmitting much more of the energy. And that's exactly what's happening inside your ear. The pivot point is about here roughly. It's harder to see the nature of the lever inside your ear because the bones are all funny shapes, but it really is there. That lever isn't the whole story. Those three bones in your ear together don't account for enough mechanical advantage to entirely fix the impedance mismatch. We need one more source of mechanical advantage. To see where that is, look at the difference in size between the eardrum and the oval window. You'll notice that the eardrum is larger than the oval window. It's able to gather a large amount of acoustic energy over its large surface area and focus that acoustic energy onto the smaller area of the oval window. Strictly speaking, I shouldn't be calling that mechanical advantage, actually, because technically that's when you've got a small input force leading to a large output force. But what we're doing here is just gathering more force by having a large surface area. But anyway, those are the two mechanisms, the difference in surface area and that crazy little lever on the inside of your ear. I'm in quarantine now, by the way, so you may occasionally hear my family in the background. One last bonus interesting thing, there's a muscle in your middle ear called the tensor tympani muscle. It's connected to the malus. That's the bone that's connected to your eardrum. And you can experience the effect of those tensor tympani muscles tensing up if you scrunch up your face, like really scrunch it up like that. You may hear a rumble in your ears. Or if you yawn, you may hear a rumble in your ears. And that rumble is basically that muscle, you know, going like that, <laughs> those little vibrations from the muscle tensing up, passing through into your inner ear. But it's actually a protective mechanism. So it, it pulls on the malus bone, which pulls on the eardrum. So the eardrum is pulled taut. And when it's tight like that, it's less sensitive to sound waves coming in. It's a reflex. So if there's a sudden loud sound or a continuous loud sound, your tensor tympani muscle will pull your eardrum taut so that less of the sound is transmitted to your inner ear. It even responds when there's a perceived threat of a potential loud sound. And actually, if your ears rumble in unusual situations where you wouldn't expect there to be a loud sound, but perhaps you're stressed or anxious, you may suffer from tonic tensor tympani syndrome. That's when your tensor tympani muscle tenses up when it shouldn't. This video was made possible by my patrons on Patreon and NordVPN. Do you need a VPN? Let's try and figure that out. So a VPN takes all the traffic, all the internet traffic coming from your device, and it encrypts it and it sends it to an endpoint somewhere in the world. It decrypts it and sends it on to whatever services you are trying to connect to, you know, emails, websites, that sort of thing. That serves two functions. The first is your internet service provider or whoever's Wi-Fi you're 
you're connected to, they can't see your traffic because it's encrypted. The second thing is whatever services you're trying to reach, like YouTube, for example, they don't know where you are. They only know the location of the endpoint somewhere in the world. And with NordVPN, you can choose where that endpoint is in the world. You can use that to get around geofenced services like this video isn't available in your country and all that sort of thing. Do you need to worry about your internet service provider or Wi-Fi provider seeing the data that you send over the internet? Well, if you only ever visit websites that have SSL enabled, then maybe you don't, but maybe you are visiting websites that don't have SSL yet, and maybe you're not always checking every website you visit. For example, I maintain some WordPress blogs and they don't have SSL. I can't control that side of it. So when I log in through some random Wi-Fi, I have to use a VPN, otherwise I'm sending my password over plain text. Even if you make sure that everywhere you visit is HTTPS, the domain name is still sent in clear text. You've got to decide whether these things are important to you or not. If they are, I strongly recommend you think about installing a VPN like NordVPN. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Steve, you'll get 70% off for three years, plus an additional 30 days, absolutely free, at least. You may even get a bit more than that if you're lucky. So check it out today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.